members this discriminatory and racist relic of an era when big labor dictated public policy in this building should be tossed on the trash heap of history where it belongs. I'm going to ask the guests in the gallery to please observe the decorum that's maintained by the House of Representatives. The chair recognizes Representative Glenn. In an article published by the Foundation for Economic Education entitled Davis Bacon, Jim Crow's Last Stand, this economic foundation cited the early history of the federal bill on which this state law is based. They found that at the time, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, that most of the major construction unions excluded blacks and that blacks faced widespread discrimination in occupational licensing and vocational training. I'm going to quote from the congressional record, hard as it is to believe some of these words were spoken, and some of them I'm not even going to speak, from the congressional hearings on the federal prevailing wage law. Missouri Democrat Congressman John Cochran said, quote, I have received numerous complaints in recent months about southern contractors employing low-paid, fill-in-the-blank, mechanics getting work and bringing up employees from the south. Alabama Democrat Clay Allgood said, quote, that contractor has cheap, blank labor that he transports, puts them in cabins, and it is labor of that sort that is in competition with white labor throughout the country, quote unquote. Ralph Jones, president of a company that gained supervision over a Department of Housing and Urban Development project in Oklahoma, had intended to employ the residents of that public housing project, but because of the requirements of the federal prevailing wage law, he was forced to hire skilled laborers only and could not hire some of the minority residents of that particular housing project. Ralph C. Thomas, the former executive director of the National Association of Minority Contractors, stated that a minority contractor who acquires a Davis-Bacon contract has, quote, no choice but to hire skilled tradesmen, the majority of which are of the majority, unquote. As a result, he said, Davis-Bacon, which is how the federal prevailing wage law is referred to, closes the door in such construction activity in an industry most capable of employing the largest number of minorities. This legislation that's been law in Michigan for decades also discriminates against the 80% of skilled trade workers in Michigan who choose to work for a contractor who is not union affiliated or work for a small business without the personnel to process the mountain of paperwork required to comply with this government price fixing scheme. And when it comes to price fixing, why don't we have similar laws fixing the price of labor in every other profession? And why don't we price fix equipment? If you have a copier that costs a thousand bucks if sold to a private sector business, why don't we have a law that says it costs 50% more if it's bought by the government? We should repeal this discriminatory barrier as quickly as possible. And repealing this antiquated price fixing scheme will save taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars a year. An estimated 300 elementary schools could have been built over the last decade with the savings that would have resulted had we repealed this a decade ago. On schools and roads, the estimates are as high as $400 million in savings to taxpayers every year. If we repeal this antiquated price-fixing law, it does not take these hundreds of millions of dollars out of our local economies. It simply will provide all contractors the 80% that are non-union and the 20% that are union, equal access to government construction projects through the same merit-based competitive bidding process by which we build all private sector construction projects. And it will no longer discriminate against the 80% of skilled tradesmen and workers who work for a non-union contractor. And by the way, I think it's offensive to that 80% of Michigan's construction workforce to suggest that if you don't belong to our government privilege club, your workmanship, professionalism, 
and skill is worthy of being disparaged. Private sector employees, non-union employees, have to abide by the same building codes, the same OSHA regulations, the same MyOSHA regulations. Are private buildings falling down in Michigan from poor workmanship? Are buildings built in states that have never had a so-called prevailing wage law any less quality than those built by that 20% of the workforce here in Michigan? And speaking of offensive, if you've seen the video urging us to keep this discriminatory price-fixing scheme in place, are we supposed to be impressed or persuaded by your ability to depict working people as squeezing the F word into a 60-second commercial twice every 10 seconds? The demise of this discriminatory, protectionist price-fixing scheme may finally be at hand. And the result will be more freedom, more competition, hundreds of millions in savings to taxpayers. Spent on children in the classroom, instead of being spent putting up the classroom around them. Mr. Speaker, I'll close by making reference to one of my constituents, Jimmy Green, who bears proudly the name of his grandfather, James Stevens. He called him, when he was a kid, Big Dad. Big Dad was a minority contractor in Detroit, a small business owner, drove a salvage truck, and he was discriminated against by this law because he didn't have enough employees to comply with all the bureaucratic and paperwork regulations of bidding on constr government construction jobs. I stand here today for Big Dad. All he wanted was a fair and open and equal opportunity to bid and compete based on his ability and his hard work and his commitment. I stand here today on behalf of all the Big Dads in Michigan's, in Michigan's construction economy, and I urge my colleagues to join me in voting yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.